Greetings, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here. We're going to take a look at our example 7 from topic 6.3. Really getting into the nitty gritty now. Finding the area under a curve and doing it and finding an exact value. That's exciting. At least it's exciting to me. So exciting. I, I, I feel like I, somebody just gave me some roses or something. It's so, such a wonderful thing. It's the only Bitmoji I could find. So what we're going to do is find the area, but we're going to use this limiting process that we've already been talking about in the previous couple of videos. And it, like I said, it takes about three or four experiences to kind of watch a problem work through thoroughly to start to get kind of comfortable. There's good news and bad news. The good news is you don't have to be able to recreate these processes on the advanced placement calc exam. The bad news is you still have to understand how they are put together and what better way to understand how they're pieced together than being able to understand the solution of one. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example seven. So here we go with our example seven. Use the limit process to find the area between y equal x cubed and the x-axis on the interval 0 to 1. Now you'll notice here in the picture I've got the graph of x cubed sketched from 0 to 1. The area underneath it is all encompassed by this shaded region. I'm not so sure why that grace, that white stripe is there, so let's color that in, right? So essentially we're finding the area of all of this gray shaded region and we're going to be able to get an exact area out of this. So how do we do that with the limit process? Well you start by understanding that any type of rectangle has an area of width times length and if it's okay with you I might call the the length the height. Now I know that that might be kind of confusing when you think about the height of a trapezoid and so I want to make sure that the width is really this distance and the height is thought of as this vertical distance. Now great news, the width has a very easy formula that we've already talked about. We mentioned how you just simply take the right endpoint B minus the left endpoint A and divide by how many subintervals works every time. And these are problems where you do have an equal amount of, um, or a consistent width, I should say, for each of your figures. So B minus A, of course, is 1 minus 0, subtracting the right boundary minus the left boundary. And the number of subintervals is going to be N. That's the whole point of the limiting process. You obviously want to put as many rectangles in as possible, because the more rectangles, the more accurate. Let's put infinity number of rectangles in. You can't get much higher than infinity, but in order to do that, you have to use the idea of a limit. That's what's going to be coming into the problem here in a bit. Now, the height is the part that students have the most trouble with, and I get it. It's a very tricky formula. And so I'm going to go ahead and share it with you. We've already talked about it briefly from a previous video, but it's always going to be determined by the function. In other words, you're going to find some x value, and then wherever that x value goes up to the curve, that's going to serve as the height of that particular rectangle. Now, you have to always be considerate of the fact that not everything in the world starts at zero. It's possible that you could have a left boundary other than zero, and so we have to use that left endpoint, which I'm going to call, in this case, A, which is zero. And then you would add to that your width of each subinterval, and then you would use a multiplier, a counter, something like an I or a K that allows you to move from your first width to your second width to your third width and so on. And so I am going to use I for pretty much most of my problems. A lot of times on the AP exam, you might see K. I've got lots of activities planned for you in class that will bring K into the picture. And so there would be our expression that we need for our height. And I know it's confusing about why do we use I times one over N. Again, the best way that I can describe this is that you're dividing this up into so many different shapes you really don't know how many that there are. Whoops, I erased some of my gray. And you do know that the width is, say, 1 over n. 
Well, all I need to do is multiply that by 1, by 2, by 3, by 4, and that would give me to 2 over n, 3 over n, 4 over n, which happen to be those stopping points on the right side of each rectangle. Did I say the right side? I did say the right side. And I'm going to prefer that you guys work with the right side, because if you choose to do the left side, you're going to have to subtract 1 from that n, that i, sorry, and deal with an i minus 1 throughout the entire problem, and it's a little bit tougher. You're going to get the same answer. We already saw that in example 5, whether you use i or i minus 1, so we're using i all the time. Now, specifically, when you simplify this, it's just f of i over n. And then when you evaluate this into the function, and this y is really the same as an f of x, you would just square i over n, and of course that would give you i cubed over n cubed. And now the stage is set. You can find the area simply by taking the limit as your number of rectangles approach infinity. You're going to add up all of these width times heights that you're about to compute as i goes from 1 to n. And we already said that the formula is the height i cubed over n cubed times the width, the width, <laughs> the width, which is 1 over n. The stage is set. As we worked our limit process problem before in example 6, the previous video, you notice that we bring out any constant over n power so that we can make our summation a little cleaner, but we don't want to bring out that expression in front of the limit. The limit is affecting anything with an n, and if I factor out 1 over n to the fourth, I certainly see that there is an n inside of that. And now I have the summation as i goes from 1 to n of simply i cubed. Now, the summation of i cubed, if you recall, we have a special limit uh, or summation property, I should say, for. And if you have to flip back a few pages, that's perfectly okay. These are not the easiest things to memorize. Um, students in my class, we typically don't need to memorize those. Um, the only exception would be in cases where I give you advanced warning about know the I squared formula. On the AP exam, you won't need to memorize these. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to write the summation notation. No, sir. I am going to change the summation of i cubed into its formula. And that formula is n squared times n plus 1 quantity squared all divided by 4. Hopefully that makes sense. And at this stage here, if you know that the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom are going to match, then you're probably on the right track. And I believe that that's exactly what's going to happen here. The degree of the numerator is going to be a 4, a power of uh, a 4 power of n, as I see this n squared and this impending n plus 1 quantity squared. The denominator is a no-brainer. We have 4 times n squared. Now remember from a previous video, I mentioned that for the numerator, you could just focus only on what the end of the fourth term is going to be here. Whoops, whoops, I need to put this 4 into the fourth. My apologies. 4 times into the fourth. For the numerator, again, you just focus on what is going to be the term that has the end of the fourth in it. And I see that this is a 1 in squared times what will end up being, well, I mean, we know that this is going to expand out to n squared plus 2n plus 1. That's easy, right? Well, if we multiply n squared through, we have n to the fourth plus, to be honest, a bunch of other stuff that doesn't even matter. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and work it out only because this one's a little easier. n squared multiplied through would give you these uh, next terms that I think you see here in gray, but I've grayed them out because they don't matter in the grand scheme of things in finding the limit, because since the powers here match 4 and 4, they're the highest degree terms, these are ignored, and we divide the coefficients, and our answer is going to be 1 over 4, and that happens to be the area of this region. This region occupies 1 fourth of a block one by one. Kind of interesting. We're just scratching the surface and finding the exact area under a curve, but we are getting pretty close to potentially a shortcut that will make the process a lot easier so that you don't have to go through all of this work. 
don't get down on this. I know it's difficult. It's some of the most difficult stuff that we're going to see throughout this entire semester, but you practice it. I promise you will get better. We'll see you at the next video.